yo creo que pasamos a la tercera conferencia del día de hoy para después podernos conectar y hacer la discusión del caso con el doctor Renato. Eh, ahorita tenemos la exposición del doctor Daniel Ronick. El doctor es especialista y también eh, especialista en ginecología y obstetricia. Tiene un máster en la Universidad de Sao Paulo en Brasil. Trabajó con el profesor Nicolaides en el King College y la Fundación de Medicina Fetal de Londres. Tiene un diplomado y doctorado en medicina fetal. Durante este tiempo el doctor Ronick coordinó y participó en lo que es el ensayo ASPRE. Trabaja actualmente como consultor en ginecología y obstetricia eh, en medicina materna fetal en el Monash Medical Center y es profesor de la Universidad de Monash de Australia. El doctor nos habla sobre predicción de preeclampsia en primer trimestre. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Daniel Ronick. I am an obstetrician and gynecologist working with maternal fetal medicine at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. I'd like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation to be here with you today. And I'm going to talk about early prediction and prevention of preeclampsia. This is an area where extensive research has been conducted in the last few years, and I'll try to give you an update with a focus on prediction at 11 to 14 weeks of pregnancy and low-dose aspirin. Why is preeclampsia an important condition to screen for? Well, it is a relatively common pregnancy complication. It affects between 2% and 5% of all pregnancies in high-income countries and even more women in developing settings. Uh, there are more than 6 million women being affected by this condition every year throughout the world. And it is an important cause of maternal death, both in uh, developing countries as well as high-income countries. In the United States, for example, preeclampsia accounts for one in five of all maternal deaths, and there is one mother dying from complications of preeclampsia every 12 minutes somewhere in the world. Preeclampsia is also an important cause of prematurity. About 15% of all premature deliveries are indicated because of complications of preeclampsia. And the problem does not finish when the pregnancy ends. Uh, if women who had preeclampsia are four times more likely to uh, die from cardiovascular causes and develop cardiovascular complications later in life compared to women who did not have preeclampsia in their pregnancies. So it is an important condition to try and identify a high-risk group um, of women who are more likely to develop disease. These are two of the most widely used guidelines around the world. The one on the left is the NICE guideline published in 2010 in the United Kingdom. And the one on the right is the guideline proposed by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in 2018. Both guidelines give us a list of five high-risk factors, which are the same. Um, previous preeclampsia, chronic kidney disease, chronic hypertension, diabetes mellitus type 1 or type 2, lupus or antiphospholipid syndrome. And a list of moderate risk factors that are very similar between the two guidelines and include first pregnancy, increased maternal age, increased maternal body mass index, pregnancy interval more than 10 years, and family history of preeclampsia in the American guideline, also black ethnicity and poor socioeconomic status. Both guidelines state that if you have one or more high risk factors, or two or more of the moderate risk factors, you should be considered high risk for preeclampsia and offered, in, offered um, treatment with low dose aspirin. There are two very obvious problems with these guidelines. One is that they were basically developed based on consensus among experts, and they were not really tested before clinical implementation. And two is that, as you can see, they attribute very similar weights to very different risk factors. In 2018, we conducted a large study in six hospitals in the United Kingdom, where we applied the NICE guideline criteria to almost 17,000 women presenting for an 11 to 14 weeks ultrasound. We also followed these women up during pregnancy. We collected data on aspirin use, 
as well as pregnancy outcomes. We identified that about 10% of the population is screened as high risk for preeclampsia at 11 to 14 weeks. But unfortunately, using this criteria alone, only identified 30% of the women who have preeclampsia. This means that 70% of women who develop preeclampsia later in pregnancy were considered low risk according to the guidelines. And even if we look at more severe disease before 37 weeks, only 40% of these women were classified as high risk. As I said, we collected data on aspirin use, and among the group of women at high risk, where 100% of them should have received aspirin, we found that only a quarter of these women received an aspirin prescription from their health professionals. So the guidelines fail to identify a high proportion of women who have preeclampsia, and also health professionals don't seem to adhere to the guidelines very well and don't prescribe aspirin to a high proportion of high-risk women. In Australia, the situation is very similar. We use a very similar guideline to screen, and only one quarter of the high-risk women receive uh, an aspirin prescription. Data from Canada shows even lower compliance rates and of all high-risk women, according to the Canadian College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, only 10% of those received a aspirin prescription. An alternative approach to screening, however, is to use mathematical models to estimate each patient's probability of developing this disease. This is very similar to what we already do for Down syndrome screening, where we calculate an initial probability based on maternal age, and then we co incorporate markers as mucotranslucency, free beta HCG, and PAPE to estimate the adjusted individual probability of Down syndrome. Here, we can use maternal history and medical characteristics, uh, previous pregnancy characteristics, to estimate an individual initial probability of having preeclampsia, and then we can combine that with biomarkers to estimate the probability of developing the disease before any given gestational age that we want. We have studied many, many biomarkers in the first trimester, and these are the three good biomarkers at 11 to 14 weeks. Uterine artery pulsatility index on Doppler ultrasound is one of these markers. You can see that the uh, blue line is the average value among women who do not have preeclampsia, whereas the red line is the average value in women who will have preeclampsia according to the gestational age of delivery. And one thing that you can see is that the uterine artery pulsatility index on Doppler ultrasound at 11 to 14 weeks is significantly elevated in women who have preeclampsia, particularly in those who have early onset disease. And there is almost no difference between cases and controls in women who develop late onset preeclampsia. The same goes for mean arterial pressure, which is already elevated at 11 to 14 weeks in women who will have preeclampsia compared to those who will not. And the difference is larger the earlier you have disease. There are two good serum biomarkers of preeclampsia at 11 to 14 weeks. The main one is placental growth factor, which is significantly reduced in women who have preterm preeclampsia. And the other one is PAPE, the reason why PAPE is not in this slide is because there is a big overlap between PAPE and PLGF, and PAPE does not add uh, to the detection rate when PLGF is already included in the risk calculation. So in summary, we can estimate an initial probability based on maternal characteristics and medical history, and then combine these three biomarkers, uterine artery pulsatility index, mean arterial pressure and biochemistry to then calculate each person's risk of having preeclampsia before a certain gestational age. And if we do that, we can uh, define a certain cutoff that we want to work with. And if we use a cutoff of about one in a hundred, we will detect 
um, about 80% of the women who have preeclampsia before 37 weeks and even more of those who have preeclampsia before 34 weeks. So this is essentially uh, doubling the detection rates compared to the NICE guidelines criteria when maternal history is used alone. Now, it's very important when we do this type of screening that we make sure people are measuring those biomarkers correctly and there are protocols and standardized ways of measuring these biomarkers. This is the protocol for measurement of uterine artery pulsatility index at 11 to 14 weeks. It's slightly different from second and third trimester of pregnancy. And the way we do it is by using transabdominal ultrasound. We identify the cervix on a sagittal view, and then we go with the transducer from one side to the other and identify the uterine arteries at the level of the cervical os. We then use a sampling gate of two millimeters, an angle of less than 30 degrees, and we apply power Doppler. And our peak systolic velocity should be above 60 centimeters per second, indicating that we are measuring the right vessel. We then use the average pulsatility index by dividing the left and the right values by two, and we plug that into the software that will calculate the risk for us. Now, it's very important to say that we need to use that as a continuous value. We don't have specific cutoffs for the uterine artery doppler alone, and as a single marker, it does not perform well, and the notching is almost always present in the first trimester, so it's a poor marker of disease development by itself. In terms of mean arterial pressure, again, we measure it using a standardized technique um, by using automated, calibrated devices that are validated for use in pregnancy. The woman should rest for five minutes before you take the measurements with the arms supported at the level of the heart. We use an appropriate cuff size for the arm circumference and we take two measurements on the right side, two measurements on the left, and then we use the average of the four measurements to calculate mean arterial pressure, which will then be um, plugged in the software that will calculate the risk for us. Well, it only makes sense to predict disease if we have an effective intervention that follows screening. And we have tried many, many things throughout the years to try and reduce the rates of preeclampsia. And the reality is that very few of these things work. I'll show you in the next slide. We have tried bed rest, reduced salt intake, exercising, avoiding exercise, uh, chocolate, we tried fish oil, we tried to supplement many vitamins and minerals, we tried calcium, um, many studies done with aspirin, and these interventions here in purple are the ones that are currently being evaluated in randomized trials. A summary of these interventions is that the rate of preeclampsia is not modified by bed rest, by restriction of physical activity or salt intake, or by supplementation of magnesium, zinc, folate, vitamin C and E, or fish oil. We know that uh, in women with poor calcium intake, uh, calcium supplementation reduces by half the incidence of preeclampsia, but it does not seem to work in women who have adequate intake of calcium. Now, aspirin has been around for a very long time, for more than 30, for more than 3,000 years, and the first randomized trial looking at the possible effect of aspirin in um, pregnancies complicated by insuffi placental insufficiency related disorders dates back to the 1980s and was published in the Lancet. This was published by a French group, and this group conducted a small randomized trial of women who had previous preeclampsia or previous fetal death or severe fetal growth restriction, and they randomized half of these women to receive aspirin at 150 milligrams from 12 weeks, and the other half to receive no treatment. And what you can see on the right side of the slide are the rates of preeclampsia, fetal death, and severe fetal growth restriction in the group that did not receive treatment in pink, 
and in the group that received treatment with aspirin in blue. And you can see a striking difference between the groups uh, in regards to these complications of pregnancy. So this was the first randomized trial, small in size, but relatively well conducted. And since then, more than 40 trials were published on aspirin use for prevention of preeclampsia, using many different inclusion criteria, varying different doses of aspirin, and starting at different times of pregnancy. Um, this was uh, an individual patient data meta-analysis that was also published in The Lancet in 2007, including 24 randomized trials of aspirin use in pregnancy, and a lot of the excitement about aspirin vanished when this study was published because although the difference between treated and untreated was statistically significant, the reduction of preeclampsia was only about 10%. But if you look into more detail in, into the studies that were included in that meta-analysis, you find that the vast majority of the studies gave a dose of aspirin below 100 milligrams, and 21 of, out of the 24 studies started aspirin too late, after 15, 16 weeks. In addition, we see that 15 different definitions of preeclampsia were used among these 24 trials. Later meta-analysis done by a Canadian group showed that if you start aspirin before 16 weeks, there is uh, a significantly reduced uh, rate of preeclampsia when you take aspirin, but that does, that does not apply if you start after 16 weeks of gestation. In addition, preeclampsia seems to uh, be mostly affected in its preterm forms by aspirin intake and not so much by um, aspirin intake when we look at term disease. These authors also showed a very clear dose-response relationship and suggested that aspirin at doses below 100 milligrams probably don't have uh, a significant effect on preeclampsia, so the dose should be above 100 milligrams. We then decided to conduct a large randomized multicenter placebo control trial in Europe. And this study uh, was conducted in 13 different hospitals across Europe, applying the Fetal Medicine Foundation first trimester combined screening for preeclampsia as a screening test for inclusion and using a dose of aspirin of 150 milligrams starting before 11 to uh, between 11 to 14 weeks and stopping at 36 weeks of gestation. We randomized about 800 women to each group and our primary outcome was preeclampsia with delivery before 37 weeks. As you can see, this is the result of the primary outcome here. There was a significant 62% reduction in preeclampsia before 37 weeks in women who received aspirin compared to placebo. Interestingly, uh, as you move towards more severe forms of preeclampsia, the magnitude of the effect also goes up with uh, an about 90% reduction of very early onset preeclampsia and no significant effect in term disease. We also looked at the effect on length of stay in the, in the neonatal intensive care unit of children born to women who took aspirin and who took placebo. And we found that babies born to women who were on aspirin and went to the neonatal intensive care unit stayed on average 21 days less than children born to women in the placebo group, which was largely driven by a reduction in preterm birth before 32 weeks, and preeclampsia accounted for 86% of these deliveries in this high-risk group. We know very well that uh, preterm birth, particularly those born before 32 weeks, um, have significantly impaired work capacity, higher risk of cerebral palsy and death, uh, in the first few years of life. So this is uh, definitely an important outcome to look at. I wanted to share with you a very recent study that was published by another group in the UK where they applied the combined screening um, routine in their hospital and they compared post and pre-implementation of screening. 
And these are the rates of preterm preeclampsia less than 37 weeks when they use the NICE guidelines alone. And this is when they implement screening, and that's what happens with the rates of preeclampsia after implementation of screening. So a massive reduction in um, the rates of preterm preeclampsia with delivery before 37 weeks. Interestingly, they also found that less than 30% of the high-risk women, according to the NICE guidelines criteria, received aspirin in their hospital. But of those who had combined screening, 99% of the high-risk women received aspirin. So compliance seems much, much better uh, with combined screening compared to screening by maternal history alone. Um, there are now some cost-effectiveness studies that were published. This is a Canadian cost-effectiveness study suggesting that the cost of screening by maternal history alone is uh, significantly higher because you have to deal with a lot more disease and complications of disease compared to when you uh, have a policy of screening with combined tests and then prescribe aspirin to high-risk women. Um, this uh, new evidence has been causing changes to various guidelines around the world. This is the International Society of Ultrasound and Obstetrics and Gynecology recommendations and the new guidelines that were published after this evidence came out. And they uh, stress in their guidelines that the combination of maternal factors, maternal arterial blood pressure, uterine artery Doppler, and placental growth factor at 11 to 14 weeks is the most efficient method of screening to identify women at high risk. And that given the superiority of this combined model, the use of ultrasound cutoffs alone uh, are not recommended. The same goes for the International Society for the Study of Hypertension in Pregnancy that also recognizes now first trimester combined screening as the best modality of risk identification. Uh, and that this should be used whenever possible within the context of the healthcare. And this is the FIGO guideline that came out in the last FIGO Congress, also suggesting that the combined test at 11 to 14 weeks is the most effective method of screening and should be the preferred method of screening even in low risk settings, um, even if you need to use more simple forms of screening, including, for example, only history and mean arterial pressure. Now, a common question that I get is how to um, prescribe aspirin at 150 milligrams, which seems to be the ideal dose, and the standard aspirin tablet dose varies in different countries. So, in the United Kingdom, for example, 75 milligrams is the standard dose, so then it's very easy. You can give two tablets, which equals 150. In the United States and in Canada, the standard dose is 81 milligrams. You could also give two tablets, which adds up to 162 milligrams. Uh, in Australia and in a large part of South America, the standard dose is 100 milligrams. You can give one and a half tablets. You would have to discard the other half because it loses its effect for the next day. Um, I'm not aware of any country that has tablets of 150 milligrams. And in Australia, we also have 300 milligrams. So you, keep, you could give half of a 300 milligram tablet and discard the other half. Now, another important aspect that is uh, coming up in the literature in the last few years, if it, 10, 5, 10 years ago, uh, most guidelines were not recognizing uh, a proven effect of aspirin in reducing preeclampsia, now the question is why not give aspirin to every pregnant woman is a safe and cheap intervention and why bother doing screening with complex uh, tests. Um, the, the arguments not to give aspirin to every pregnant woman is that we don't really know if this intervention will be effective when applied to the entire uh, general obstetric population. Another important problem, and for me maybe one of the most important problems, 
is that when you prescribe to women who do not have a high risk or a recognized risk factor, uh, adherence to treatment tends to be a lot lower. And we know that pregnant women are reluctant to take medication in pregnancy. And that will inevitably reduce the effectiveness of the intervention if people don't take the medication as they should. Um, we also don't know what would happen in terms of side effects if you give aspirin to millions and millions of women. Uh, we know that aspirin seems safe in randomized trials that focus on high-risk populations, but we don't have that data in um, trials looking at the general population. In fact, a couple of randomized trials try to give aspirin to women um, of the general population or without major risk factors. And what they found is a much, much lower compliance rate than what we found in the ASPRI trial of only about 50%. Also, they showed no benefit of aspirin treatment in those populations, and in some cases, increased risk of minor bleeding episodes. So I don't think giving aspirin to everyone is a good idea. So in conclusion, prediction of preeclampsia should be done early because treatment only works if started before 16 weeks. Um, it should preferably be done by combined screening, which is better than uh, stratification by risk factors alone. Calcium supplementation helps when calcium intake is low, but it does not help in populations where calcium intake is appropriate. Aspirin at 150 milligrams, and that's the ideal dose, reduces preterm preeclampsia by more than 60% in high-risk women. Universal treatment, in my opinion, is a bad idea. Although treatment is safe, we would probably have a much lower adherence to treatment the effectiveness is not well studied in low-risk populations, and there may be an increase in side effects if we were to give aspirin to all women. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Dr. Cronin eh, se encuentra conectado en este momento y le agradecemos por su excelente ponencia. Eh, no es casualidad que nuestras primeras charlas y con lo que estamos aperturando el Congreso sobre, sea sobre el primer trimestre. Ya vimos que en el primer trimestre es un momento esencial, importante, que no podemos dejar de pasar para tanto para diagnosticar malformaciones tempranas como para predecir también riesgo de trisomías y también para predecir y prevenir preeclampsia. La preeclampsia en nuestro país, y no estamos ajenos a ninguna parte del mundo, es una de las patologías más frecuentes, con mayor incidencia y que conlleva a una gran morbi mortalidad tanto materna como fetal. Y es por esa razón que es muy importante este tema y no podemos dejar de evaluar y hacer un screening en primer trimestre sobre preclancia. Eh, como hablaba el doctor, muy importante, a pesar de que se sabe que eh, la aspirina funciona, a pesar de que se sugiere dar aspirina a todas las pacientes, aún tenemos el problema que hay un cuarto de las pacientes o que no están tomando aspirina por indicación de su médico o que la adherencia no es la adecuada. Yo creo que este momento es muy importante importante para que el doctor nos haga énfasis en la importancia del tratamiento, en la importancia de la prevención y qué es lo que deberíamos hacer eh, para poder fortalecer nuestra atención a la gestante y poder darle un mejor tratamiento durante su gestación. ¿Hay alguna pregunta? Vamos a ir viendo preguntas de, del auditorio y yo quería eh, preguntarle al doctor Rolni, porque acá en el Perú eh, tendemos a hacer, sí, eh, no, 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 porque assim, a minha paciente não vai sair porque se eu não tiver laudo e imagem. O laudo ok, mas a imagem eu não tenho. Então eu coloquei lá e eu pensei, eu não consigo ingressar ainda. Né? En el Perú, nosotros biomarcadores, hacemos el IP de las arterias uterinas, la toma de la pica media, pero nos cuesta mucho hacer el factor de crecimiento placentario, a pesar de su beneficio, y es por el costo elevado que tiene. Yo creo que eso pasa mucho en Latinoamérica. Eh, yo quisiera saber que usted nos dijera cuánto más de sensibilidad tiene agregar a la historia, a, las, eh, a la presión de, de la arteria, a la medición de la presión y a las arterias uterinas, cuánto más aumenta mi sensibilidad haciendo el factor de crecimiento placentario. Y si ustedes en Australia le toman a todas las pacientes 
pacientes en primer trimestre factor de crecimiento placentario para predicción de preclancia. All right. Um, thank you for the invitation. I just wanted to thank Dr. Walter and Elsie for the, the for the invitation to be here with you. Um, I don't know if I understood the question correctly, but I think the question was whether uh, uh, PLGF increases the sensitivity of screening. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. So. So the, the advantage of doing this kind of screening is that you can use uh, different combinations of markers. You don't need to use the full screening uh, algorithm. And if you use uh, maternal history and demographic characteristics plus uterine arteries and mean arterial pressure, you detect about 70% of the cases of preterm preeclampsia. So you lose about 5% detection rate by not doing uh, placental growth factor. And yes, it's a problem in South America in general, so I'm from Brazil, and I know that in Brazil it's also very hard to do biochemistry, we don't do it routinely, um, so in, in some settings you could use a simpler version of the algorithm. Um, in terms of how things work in Australia, we, we have more access to PLGF and PAPE and, and biochemistry in general here, but PLGF in general is only done by private clinics, private providers. Um, there are some public hospitals that are doing uh, combined screening for preeclampsia at 11 to 14 weeks, uh, and a lot of them are doing it in a research setting. For example, John Hyatt in Sydney and here in, in our hospital we do, but this is not the routine uh, in most public services in Australia. Thank you. Eh, como la gente del doctor, eh, yo creo que estamos eh, no, no muy parecidos porque acá todavía en la parte privada no le mandamos a todas las pacientes porque todavía para nosotros representa un costo elevado. Eh, pero sí sería ideal en algún momento empezar a utilizar todos los marcadores. Por si alguien tiene interés, acá en el Perú sí hacemos eh, factor de crecimiento placentario, se está haciendo en un laboratorio y, bueno, podrían solicitarlo sin ningún problema. Y lo otro que quiero hacer énfasis es en el tratamiento, porque en el Perú no hay aspirina de 150, hay aspirina de 100, y entonces lo que siempre sugerimos es dar una dosis mayor. Por lo tanto, se tiene que dar 150, pero el error está en que muchos pacientes ese 50 lo guardan para el día siguiente y es lo que no se debe hacer, ¿verdad? Se debe utilizar una pasilla y media y lo otro desecharlo, porque si no pierde sensibilidad, ¿correcto, doctor? Sí. Um... I'm going to talk in English because my okay. pen is okay. terrible. It's okay. <laughs> no, no, I don't speak Romanian. Sorry. Portuguese, sí, pero okay. Um, yes, yeah, so the right dose is 150, and if you use half of the tablet, you can't give the other half on the next day because um, when you break the tablet, it sort of loses the effect for the next day. It's it's an extremely cheap medication, so it's very easy to throw that other half in the bin. Um, I usually prefer to give half of the 300 milligrams tablets because it's easy to break the tablet in two and I'm not aware of any country that has tablets of 150 milligrams. Um, so the two options are one and a half of the 100 milligrams or half of the 300 milligrams tablet. Okay. Uh, I would I I like to ask you, I ask you some questions, Ronit. Uh, yeah. We have some questions here on the, on the chat. So uh, the question always is if we, if we have some secondary effects uh, with aspirin. So the people is asking if, if it's correct to, to provide some other medication to protect the, the mucus of the stomach. Yeah, we, we don't routinely give uh, gastric protectors. We know that about 10% of the women taking aspirin will have gastric side effects, and you could give them omeprazole or isomeprazole for this 10% of the women, but 90% of the women will have no side effects at all, and, and 
I don't think we should be giving uh, gastric protectors to everyone because of those 10%. So I would, I would give it if there are side effects, but I wouldn't give it if there are no side effects. And ju just a side note is that there is a lot of research now with ezomeprazole as well as a possible intervention to prevent preeclampsia. It's one of the medications that's been studied at the moment. Okay, another question that uh, people is asking also, also is uh, we have enough evidence today to to provide to provide our patient with this uh, screening for preeclampsia, and we have a strong evidence to 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 prevent with aspirin. So why do you think uh, United States state is not uh, taking into account the recommendations of the Fetal Medicine Foundation? <laughs> There is a, a good question, and it's, it's a question that I don't have the answer for. Uh, one, one of the problems they have in the United States is uh, a very limited number of sonographers. So much so that they are moving towards doing cell-free DNA screening for almost everybody, but they cannot do a scan between 11 and 14 weeks. Um, and you'd see happening a lot in the United States or in a lot of the states of the United States, people having an IPT at 10, 11 weeks, and then they don't have a scan until 20 weeks. Um, so, so these are some problems that they have. A lot of the previous trials uh, that were done with lower doses of aspirin were done in the United States. And because there are no randomized trials comparing two different doses, uh, I think the American College has been very reluctant to accept uh, that the dose should be more than 100 milligrams. Um, so what, what they usually recommend is start between 12 and 28 weeks and give see what 81 milligrams, which is the standard dose in the United States. Uh, but I think it's a little bit because the evidence doesn't come from the U.S., a little bit because there are no randomized trials comparing two doses in the same trial, and uh, also the difficulty they would have to screen everybody and to do scans uh, in the first trimester. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bueno, muchísimas gracias al doctor Rolny. Nos ha quedado claro que a todas las pacientes tenemos que hacer nuestra clínica para predicción de preeclampsia en primer trimestre. A todas tomas de la presión. Idealmente, reposo cinco minutos y dos tomas en cada brazo por el efecto del mandil blanco. Eh, a todas las pacientes, tomas de arterias uterinas, vía abdominal o vía transvaginal, como ustedes prefieren y como estoy hablando a los pacientes. E idealmente, hacer. Eh, el factor de cumplimiento placentario si es que se podría y si la paciente sale en riesgo alto que es una de las preguntas que están haciendo es importante que no debemos evaluar los marcadores por sí solos sino que debemos ir a un calculador calcular y si ese paciente es el riesgo alto que se está considerando ser por debajo de un en 100 según la Fetal Medicine Foundation es el paciente es candidata a recibir aspirina 150 miligramos desde antes de la semana 16 hasta la semana 36 a no ser que tenga algún efecto secundario Muchísimas gracias, doctor Ronnie. Ha sido un placer tenerlo con nosotros y realmente le agradecemos mucho estar eh, su, su exposición. It's my pleasure. I just wanted to thank you again for the invitation. Good to see some friends as well, Renato. I can see you there. Um, <laughs> so, thank you so much. Gracias. Vamos a pasar con el doctor Renato que ya está con nosotros. Como ustedes ven, el doctor Renato ha sido profesor de muchos, aunque estemos en diferentes partes del mundo. Eh, es una persona a quien tengo el enorme placer de conocer, también ha sido mi profesor. Eh, y como les decía inicialmente, es un doctor que ha cambiado, ha sido parte del cambio de la medicina fetal y de la obstetricia en Brasil. El doctor radica en Campinas, pero realmente ya muchísimo importante porque es impulsor y es uno de los promotores y es una de las personas que más ha publicado en lo que es cirugía fetal y especialmente en defectos abiertos y también es un amante de la cardiología fetal yo creo que es uno de los pocos que está dividido entre neuro y cardio porque normalmente a alguien le gusta más pero al doctor le encantan la, las dos especialidades 
Y bueno, solo para recordar el, el doctor, el director de la Fundación de Medicina Hospital de Latinoamérica, es coordinador del curso de posgrado, a la que muchos peruanos estamos participando cada vez más, eh, es director científico también del centro, es, es revisor de artículos en importantes revistas como AIU y Terapia Fetal y Diagnóstico Prenatal. Es miembro también asesor recientemente de la Sociedad de ISOC. Muchas felicidades, doctor. Y tiene una maestría en ciencia de la Escuela Paulista de Medicina. Doctor, un placer haber escuchado su primera charla sobre corazón fetal. Vamos a ir viendo las preguntas que llegan. Y quería preguntar que usted eh, decía que las cardiopatías fetales, que son las transformaciones más frecuentes en los cerebros, podrían llegar hasta 1 en 150. A diferencia del síndrome de Down, que podría llegar a 1 en 1000. Y sin embargo, tenemos una... Eh, decir, no hay médico que no tiene un screening de trisomía 21, sin embargo, puede ser por tiempo, puede ser por experiencia, nos hace todavía muy difícil evaluar corazón fetal en primer trimestre. Eh, a pesar de que tenemos una ayudita, o sea, no, cuando evaluamos el cerebro no tenemos la ayuda que tenemos en el corazón, porque sabemos que si tenemos un, una translucencia elevada o tenemos un ducto venoso alterado, o un ducto alterado, no vamos a sospechar de que el bebé puede tener una cardiopatía. Entonces, eso es una ayuda realmente que hace que indirecta que ganamos cuando hacemos el primer trimestre. La pregunta es, ¿qué ha sido usted? ¿Cuánto tiempo la ha llevado para poder el primer trimestre? Pregunta, no, no la escuché, tiene un ruido en el fondo. ¿Cómo que? ¿Qué tan difícil es evaluar corazón fetal en primer trimestre? Suponiendo que no tenemos equipos de alta gama como quizás lo que tiene, ¿no? O sea, sí, el problema, es, yo creo que eh, en, eh, tenemos que iniciar mirar el corazón en el primer trimestre, es el primer paso. Independiente del equipo que tengas, eh, y mirar por vía abdominal y principalmente por vía transvaginal. A los casos que lo permitan y a los casos que, como hablé, tengan una translucencia local por encima de 3.5, por encima del marcador de translucencia de 1.95. Estos creo son los casos que debemos iniciar el estudio. Uh, muchas veces estamos más cerca de la semana 11, tenemos que dejar a la semana 12, 13, 14 y ahí va a ser, ser un poco más fácil. El tema es que estamos cambiando todo lo que hacemos en el segundo trimestre para el primer trimestre. Y obviamente que con, con transductores de más alta frecuencia van a poder tener imagen, como he mostrado a ustedes, que son con 6, 12 MHz. Y obvio, pues son los casos que tengo una translucencia mayor de 3,5. Cuanto más la translucencia, mayor, mayor la posibilidad de encontrar. Entonces, cuando tengo ductos alterados, translucencia aumentada, una serie de marcadores, tengo que mirar a este, a este, este corazón. También, por ejemplo, para diagnóstico o rastreo quizás de, de, de hernia diafragmática, el grupo de Rosa Nicolai ha publicado que 50% de los casos en 2011 hicieron el rastreo del diagnóstico de hernia en la semana 11-14. En el 2019 bajaron para 33% más o menos. El tema es mirarse el corazón, tiene un tamaño normal, el eje está normal, y esto es muy simple, o sea, esto es muy sencillo, se puede hacer cualquier uno, desde que lo mire. Entonces, estamos buscando trasero. Karina habló mucho de las cosas que estamos mirando. Y habló dos, tres segundos, hacer los cortes axiales, pasa tres, tercero, ventrículo, acueducto y cosas. El tema es que el corazón es mucho más fácil que el sistema nervioso central. El corazón tiene las cuatro cámaras, algunos vasos, he visto. El sistema nervioso central se va cambiando desde el primer trimestre hasta el final. Entonces, es eh, mucho más difícil, por eso hay, hay muy, mucha poca gente que realmente lo sabe, el sistema nervioso central. El corazón es más tranquilo, o sea, van a hacer el estudio en cuatro cámaras, eje, tamaño, y no cambia. O sea, entonces mi información es que se si tiene una transducencia aumentada y empiece a intentar estudiar el corazón. Y una vez que empiece a estudiar, va ganando experiencia, y con la experiencia va haciendo más rastreos correctos y más diagnósticos tempranos.
y ¿se, se atrevería a dar diagnósticos en primer trimestre o todavía sugiere que debemos eh, sugerir que puede tener una cardiopatía y esperar a, a una ecografía precoz entre 16 o a una morfológica esperar a la 18? En realidad, hacemos el, el rastreo del diagnóstico, o sea, la paciente va a ser acompañada porque muchas van a evoluir, por ejemplo, una treza tricuspida, pueden cambiar algunas formas y valores que tenemos que evaluar, pero sí lo damos el diagnóstico porque tenemos, como ha mostrado usted, la transposición, cuartos, cuarta semilla ahorita siempre un diagnóstico postnatal, pero el tema es que una vez que tenga una alteración, o sea el, siempre habla la gente que viene acá y ustedes prueben de esto tenemos que probar que el corazón es normal, no tenemos que hacer el diagnóstico el diagnóstico es una fase que vamos a hacer en varios estudios y en el corazón vamos a pasar en este caso que que sospechamos que es anormal a un cardiologista pediátrico para que él lo avalíe y lo dé la orientación si va a cirugía, si es o si es crítico. Nosotros tenemos un papel que es el diagnóstico, es el tamizaje, el rastreo. Si llegamos hasta el diagnóstico o cerca del diagnóstico, muy bien, pero esto no es nuestro problema. Nuestro problema es hacer el rastreo y que van a esto. Por esto la translucencia tiene un papel importantísimo porque nos colocó la obligación de mirar el corazón porque dos tercios de las, de las, de las cardiopatías son sospechadas cuando tenemos transducencia por encima del presidio 99. Entonces, indirectamente tenemos que buscar el corazón. Muy bien. Doctor, tengo una pregunta del doctor, de su ex alumna, el doctor Rommel Lacunza. Sí. El doctor Rommel le pregunta, eh, ¿qué opina sobre el uso de slow flow en cardio en primer trimestre como utilidad? Eh, yo no recomiendo ni power doble. Yo recomiendo que hagan doble convencional para mirar el flujo y todo. Puede ser que en algún momento el slow flow o MV flow, whatever, cualquier nombre que se llame esto, sea flujo más sencillo, puede ayudar en algunas cosas, pero yo en el momento no creo que traces informaciones importantes. O sea, yo creo que lo más importante es hacer el estudio bidimensional el estudio con doble color convencional, después vamos caminando a SIC y algunas otras cosas. Puede ser que para, para autoevaluar el flujo pulmonar o alguna cosa pueda hacer alguna información, pero eh, no creo que, que la reproducibilidad de, esta, de estas tecnologías sean tan aplicables como las otras. Es, es, es mi opinión. O sea, son muy bonitas, pero el corazón se, se mueve mucho y el slow flow borra mucho, lo, lo contamina mucho. Muy bien, doctor. Por el momento no hay más preguntas, pero con usted nos vamos a ver en la tarde. Muchísimas gracias, como siempre, por su aporte. Gracias, a vos. gracias a vos. <ríe> Y nos vamos a ver en la tarde. Eh, ahora... Un abrazo, Walter. Gracias, gracias doctor. Gracias por, por tu participación. Un abrazo. A tarde nos vemos. Un abrazo. Sí, nos vemos en la tarde. Un abrazo. Hasta la tarde, doctor. Ahora vamos a pasar al simposio que está a cargo, va a ser sobre medicina fetal, va a estar a cargo del doctor Rogelio Cruz. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, a nombre del doctor Rogelio Cruz Martínez, director de Medicina Fetal México, agradecemos el espacio otorgado por el doctor Walter Ventura y la Sociedad Peruana de Ultrasonido en Obstetricia y Ginecología. Tomaremos unos minutos para mostrarles la nueva, forma, la nueva era en la formación educativa en Medicina Fetal. Listo. ¿Pueden, ¿Pueden verme? Disculpan, ¿me confirman? Sí, debemos. Sí, perfecto. Muchísimas gracias. Pues nuevamente agradecemos a nombre del doctor Rogelio Cruz eh, este espacio para presentarles brevemente eh, el campus. Eh, los estamos invitando a ser parte de nuestra nueva comunidad educativa a través del campus virtual, el cual es único en su tipo y que gracias al uso de nuevas tecnologías permite mejorar la práctica clínica de los médicos. En este campus los usuarios pueden realizar un recorrido virtual sin tener que desplazarse a la ciudad de Querétaro donde se encuentra eh, este, este campus de manera física, permitiendo que puedan conocer todas eh, las instalaciones, nuestras salas ecográficas, nuestras salas educativas y el quirófano donde realiza los procedimientos el doctor Rogelio Cruz Martínez. 
Esta plataforma está diseñada de manera accesible para que ustedes puedan ingresar de manera fácil y sin ningún problema. Es muy intuitiva la, 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 el ingreso a esta, a esta plataforma. Hay que dar eh, la parte de iniciar y, y todos los usuarios tienen que registrarse. Para poder registrarse nos piden nuestros datos completos, que es nuestro nombre, nuestro apellido, correo electrónico y generar una, una contraseña. ¿Okay? Esta plataforma, eh, al inicio ustedes pueden conocer toda la oferta educativa que tenemos eh, de parte de Medicina Fetal México. Actualmente tenemos nuestro curso de básico de, primer, eh, de diagnóstico prenatal en primer trimestre. Este curso es el que se encuentra habilitado en este momento. Más adelante habilitaremos eh, otra serie de cursos como procedimientos invasivos, Doppler, eh, simulación de láser placentario, etc. Todos nuestros cursos están diseñados para que los alumnos puedan aprender de manera interactiva a través de las diferentes herramientas, como son simulaciones prácticas y clases totalmente diseñadas para un mayor aprendizaje. Cada curso se encuentra habilitado por un periodo de tiempo determinado y ustedes pueden hacer la compra a través de la página de PayPal. Eh, cada curso se encuentra dividido a su vez en diferentes módulos y estos módulos están divididos con eh, clases teóricas y práctica. Y práctica. ¿No? Eh, la idea es de que ustedes puedan interactuar entre todas las, las áreas que forman parte de este campus virtual eh, y pueden, pueden trasladarse tanto del camp, de, de, desde el auditorio hacia nuestras salas ecográficas. Vamos a ver en este momento un pequeño módulo. Ustedes van a poder visualizar todas las clases teóricas. Eh, de, con nuestros especialistas en nuestro campus, eh, en nuestro auditorio 360 grados y poder hacer este, este recorrido virtual. Estas clases teóricas virtuales eh, están abiertas y están adaptándose para que cada alumno pueda, pueda visualizarlas tantas veces como considere necesario y en el horario que, que mejor le parezca. Está diseñado también nuestro campus para que eh, el usuario pueda visualizar primero la parte teórica y después avanzar a la parte práctica. Eh, esta es la, la innovación en esta sesión práctica eh, a través de casos clínicos reales. El usuario puede realizar diagnósticos y pronósticos lo más certero posible a la, a la realidad, ya que son los casos reales que vemos día a día en el centro. Eh, el, el usuario puede tener una retroalimentación de manera inmediata, ya que al momento de que llega a contestar, eh, el, el sistema le, le indica si fue correcta o incorrecta su pregunta. Y cada uno de los casos está acompañado por una retroalimentación donde explica el porqué de esta, de esta respuesta. ¿no? También tenemos asesorías, bueno, retroalimentación a través de videos que, 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 que graban nuestros especialistas. Cada curso también cuenta con una parte de masterclass. En esta masterclass, eh, el usuario... Eh, va de la mano con los especialistas a, acompañando a una valoración eh, ultrasonográfica de pacientes, además de que le permite perfeccionar el uso de la botonería, ya que el, el, el médico acompaña al usuario desde que iniciamos la valoración de una paciente hasta que finaliza. ¿No? Este es un pequeño ejemplo de, de, cómo, de cómo el usuario puede tener eh, una visión completa de, de una valoración eh, de pacientes y que esto además al final del día pues, le permite obtener diferentes tips y consejos para realizar una adecuada, y exploración, eh, una adecuada exploración ultrasonográfica, mejorando así su técnica para detectar alguna anomalía fetal. ¿no? Yo podría seguirles contando acerca de este campus virtual, pero esto solo es una pequeña parte de lo que de lo que forma esta nueva experiencia en educación en medicina fetal. Eh, en esta ocasión, y agradeciendo el apoyo y el espacio, tenemos 10 becas para que ustedes puedan conocer eh, esta nueva modalidad en educación. Eh, estas 10 becas, el doctor Walter ya más adelante les indicará cuál sería el procedimiento para poder ser acreedor a una de estas becas y poder ser parte de nuestra comunidad de medicina fetal. Agradezco el tiempo que me han permitido presentar este campus, pero ¿quién mejor para presentarles que el doctor Cruz, que es el, el, el que desarrolla este campus? Bienvenidos a la nueva era en educación en medicina fetal. Eso sería todo. Muchísimas gracias.
queremos presentarles acerca del campus virtual. Y como lo comenté hace un momento, tenemos 10 becas eh, que el doctor Walter ya será, nos hará a favor de, de, de darnos la dinámica para poder hacer acreedores a 10 alumnos para que sean parte de esta nueva modalidad del campus. Muchísimas gracias, licenciada Karina.